Um, yes, thank you for the introduction. I will be talking to you about the small town of Scunthorpe and my project around it, which will mean nothing to most of you, but to those who do know England, Scunthorpe is, I would like to say, a slight backwater, but we'll, uh, we'll engage in that. Um, so I'd like to talk about the project which is funded by Historic England and partly from our government and it's part of Historic England's wider programme of area, area investigating and mapping, similar to the other projects that uh, Matt described yesterday. So Scunthorpe is a small town in what is now a local authority of North Lincolnshire in England and North Lincolnshire is a rural agricultural landscape but it does have sizeable pockets of industrial and residential development. The area is somewhat isolated from the rest of England with the, uh, with the Humber Estuary to the north, um, the River Trent to the, uh, to the west and a very much more rural county of Lincolnshire to the south. However, North Lincolnshire and Scunthorpe in particular do enjoy international links via the seaports there's a, a port here called Trent Port and there are other ports, Immingham and Grimsby and the like, further down the coast. And the, uh, its position in, rel in relation to the Humber Estuary um, and the importance of that and these two big rivers will become clear with the River Trent, which comes down all the way through the, uh, through the Midlands to drain into the Humber Estuary in the North Sea and the Ewes, which has lots of tributaries that fan out across from, um, from Yorkshire. So both of them have a very wide catchment area. Um, so this is my area of survey as it was um, drafted in the 1820s and this uh, map illustrates quite nicely some of the characteristics of this area. Um, I've shown my area in red so it takes up most of the screen there. Um, so moving from west to east we have the lower reaches of the River Trent meandering here. Actually it's flowing northwards I should point that out at this point but meandering through this fairly wide broad valley um, which uh, as I said before, it joins the Humber. And then in this wide valley, we have an area, several areas of commons, which is where there would be common grazing, which is an indication of how poor it was agriculturally. And then as the map shows, we have a steep rise up to what, uh, this area here. Um, again, we've got lots of common ground and warrens and the like, and this is a reflection of windblown sounds and acidic soils in the area. Another step up, and then areas of woodland, and then we descend again down into what was a river, the old river Anklon, which is a kind of another meandering river, but by this time even had been straightened with this very straight navigation. And we can see water management is starting to creep in. Further over to the west, we have drainage of the Hatfield Chase um, with the Dutch engineers coming over, and we can already see some drainage ditches being uh, created here. Um, and as you can see at this time, um, settlement was relatively sparse. We have very few and dispersed villages and Scunthorpe, which I've highlighted here in red, was one of the smaller of those villages as well. It's basically a small hamlet at the crossroads. So if we contrast that with this area two centuries later, you can see there's been an enormous amount of change. We still have the river, obviously, meandering northwards. You can see its muddy waters here. A little bit more development and expansion of the villages. Trent Port here, which is one of those uh, hubs for transportation. Um, a bit more agriculture. Most, more of this area here is under cultivation. Then, of course, is massive conurbation, compa uh, urbanisation. Compare that to what Scunthorpe had been two centuries ago. And then we have a large industrial area still surviving here, and this is the heart of Scunthorpe Steelworks. Um, this now light industrial distribution centre area, which was previously Steelworks. And then as we move further west, uh, east to the east, very similar to what we had but only two centuries before, not so much has changed in this area. So the geology really determines this landscape and it's complex and it changes abruptly from east to west. You can see we're, we're only a couple of kilometres from one to the other here. And this is a very much simplified version of that, uh, of that uh, landscape and geology. I'm going to be focusing on these two areas here today, which is the floodplain and the ironstone plateau. Um, the floodplain, until, as I mentioned before, until the 18th century, it was a low, a low lying. Uh, area with a mix of peaty ground which had developed on kind of the undulating surface of windblown sands and some alluvium and this land was difficult to farm and unproductive but this began to change in the beginning of the 19th century as the land was improved by a process called warping so 
Warping is the process of covering lands with alluvium by artificial means rather than natural river alluviation. So no doubt in, uh, influenced by you know, observations in the Nile Valley and the Indus Valley, but this is a way of doing that, that process artificially. It was published in Arch Arch uh, sorry, Arch agricultural journals in the 1820s, and they suggested that it had actually been in use in this particular area since the middle of the 1700s. And the aim of warping was to improve soil quality by depositing rich and fertile silts and fine gravels across the land, and in do so, doing so, covering those acid peats and sands with more neutral deposits and providing a better soil structure. And the process of warping, of adding that alluvium to the land, also raised the height of the land, which in turn made it easier to drain. So I've put together a quick schematic of how warping worked. And this is very much a simplification of the process, but it'll give you an idea of what I'm talking about for when I show you things later. Um, so here we have the river. Back. Here we have the, the river trend, as I said, flowing northwards. And it has its own kind of natural embankment, these natural levees, as we'll see later. And then a warping drain was cut from the river. Sorry, one one again huge great big drain was cut from the river inland towards the higher ground over this side and that was to allow water from the river to, to move inland and then a warping compartment and it was protected by banks as well sorry and then a warping compartment this was the kind of the, the target area at any one time um, a large bank was um, built out constructed around that and ditches were cut through through the compartment to allow water to move across it and all of the water was um, controlled by sluice gates one on the river, one there, a more complex situation than I've shown, but it gives you an idea. Um, just as an indication of how poor the soil was at this time before the warping took, took place, um, where they have put boreholes through and looked at the, that interface between the, uh, the ground surface and the earliest warp, um, bog cotton is quite common, so we're talking about a very wet, boggy, acidic area. So, as we go on, the, um, so in normal circumstances, as I said, the river trend is flowing that way and uh, we have everything set up for the first warp. The key to this process is really that massive estuary that we have to the north. Um, it, at a high tide, this would push very silty, mud-rich waters back down, uh, into the, down the river trend for quite some distance. Warping was carried out for many, many kilometres further south than this. Um, the sluice gates would be, be opened and that muddy water was then allowed in to other warping compartments, and uh, our example here, and this would spread out across the, water, the uh, warping compartment. And the, the, those ditches would kind of angle it around that what would be an undulating surface so that the idea was to build up a fairly level um, area. Eventually that would fill and then the silts in that water would be allowed to settle out into the compartment. And then once the, t once the tide had turned and when the water was flowing again, in it, the, the movement was going that way and the silt had been allowed to settle out, those cleaner waters, which had now dropped their sediment load, would be allowed back along the warping channel by the opening of the sluice gate and that would scour out any deposits that had been in the warping channel and it would join the river again and continue its usual flow. And this, pro this process was, was repeated several times um, within, a, within a season, so uh, uh, through the spring tides. And gradually that silt would build up in the walking, walking, walking compartment. And if you were to put a trench across one of these compartments, you'd see it as a series as a laminated deposit. It's quite narrow, but um, building up over uh, several occasions. And eventually, once it was judged that enough warp had built up on the land, um, the uh, it was, clover and oats were, were, were grown on the land just to, uh, to get it to settle down. But those main kind of structural elements, the bank and the ditches within, were either either infilled or the bank was removed and deliberately taken away because that was also agriculturally productive land now. And so it, was, it, it, it did interfere with the process of farming, so they were taken away. But the, war, the main warping drains tended to remain so that they could serve other other warping compartments 
Uh, contemporary accounts suggest that an area of about one to two kilometres could be warped to a satisfactory depth in about two to two and a half years. So this wasn't an overnight process. It was something that was quite long and drawn out. It required a lot of input in terms of construction of the banks and the digging of the ditches. And it also meant that that land, whatever it had been useful for before, was taken out of that process for the time being as well. And eventually this became very productive for uh, cereals and potatoes. And obviously with the uh, proximity to the river trip and potatoes was a suitable crop because it's a heavy crop that needs a, a lot to transport it. So we come to the uh, question of what is the significance of warping? You know, it's a relatively recent uh, activity. And it's a process of historical and regional interest. It does not appear to have been practiced anywhere else in England. And that is obviously because it's very specific geographic and hydrological uh, requirements. And it's really shaped the landscape of the Lower Trent Valley. But the physical remains of the process do survive either as integral elements of the landscape, as we shall see, or as archaeological features. But there's also the point that the warping has effectively sealed and buried old land surface and environments. And this obviously has implications for remote sensing, but also for the preservation of those old surfaces. And at this point, you're probably thinking, what does this all look like? So this is a 1940s vertical. Um, you can, may just be able to pick out in this area here some of the earthworks associated with warping. It's not, I'll just zoom in slightly there. It's not, it's not common for them to, to be preserved in this uh, amount of clarity and, and crispness and I'm not sure whether this is because this was a failed warp or a relatively recent warp it might have been one that was abandoned partway through for whatever reason or maybe just that it was more recent than some of the others we see on the photographs um, and this is the lidar um, a couple of lidar visualizations to just show how low some of these remains are other features do survive better um, you may be able to pick out a ditch here but Overall, the LIDAR was a, a supplementary rather than a primary source for this. And as you might have noticed, there's very little correlation between those internal ditches and what would then become the field system, the kind of post-enclosure field system. Um, if we look at some of the aerial photography, this shows some quite striking details. And you can see some of the complexities that I kind of skirted over in my uh, schematic. You can see the arrangement of, of banks here. There's some kind of strange looping. This might be the position of a sluice gate here. Um, we have other banks and things that would be used to funnel that water around the warping compartment to try and make sure the warp went everywhere that it was needed. Um, obviously, this set, all of these survive as, earth work, uh, as crop marks. There is something underground, but you can see this drainage ditch has actually reutilized a, a large warping drain. You can see where it's stopped here, and you can just see the banks, but there is a drain running through that is still active. Um, we don't have so many specialist photographs of the warping, um, and I think that's probably one of those historical things where it is a relatively recent process, so maybe it was ignored and overlooked. But where we do have it, it has been uh, showing us some interesting points. You can see the large banks that flanked a warping drain here, and you can see how crisply defined they are, and that's the indication of where, rather than having a bank that over time has been moved backwards and forwards by ploughing, it was literally taken away in one foul swoop all you're seeing is the very bottom of the bank which had to be quite um, firmly padded down so that it wouldn't seep water out but we also have this rather unusual feature here I'm not sure how clear it is to you but basically it's a kind of alternating dark and lighter lines in this uh, this arrangement going in, and it does continue along the edge of the uh, we're kind of on the edge of the floodplain here the land starts to rise as we come to here um, I wasn't quite sure what this represented, but one of the things that it might indicate is um, a slightly different system of warping. So what I've described so far has been called flood warping. It's where the river does the river and the tidal waters do the war, do the action for you. But historically, there are also accounts over on Hatfield Chase of cart warping, where they would go out and they would excavate an old river, river paleo channel, take the loom from, from there, and then cart it out across areas of boggy ground and stuff, almost on a little railway. And then, then the little railway would move as, as areas were filled in. So part of me is wondering whether this very marginal area where the tidal floodwaters might not have been able to quite reach whether cart warping was applied in this area instead and 
obviously the nature of the warping infrastructure is such that the warp ditches aren't going to give us the kind of cultural material that we might expect from brick big prehistoric or medieval ditches. But the environmental conditions, that kind of dampness, and um, obviously their relative recency means that organic material can survive and it can be good. And this is an example from an excavation just the other side of the River Trent in advance of a wind farm construction. And it uh, shows quite nicely the, the amazing preservation of uh, the sluice in this area with all the, with the timber boarding and lots of uh, complex engineering in there as well. So it tells us that archaeology does have more to tell us about this process than just those old accounts in the uh, agricultural journals. As we step out a little bit and use the LIDAR to help us understand the, uh, the landscapes and the implications of warp deposits, we can see, as I showed you before, the river running northwards, its levees naturally formed. And then I should probably point out that in this, I've really compressed, uh, exaggerated those lower layers so that we could see the very subtle differences in land level. So we have uh, down to minus one meters below sea level in these areas here. Then the warped areas, um, of this kind of moving from the lighter blue to the cream. These areas, which are still very low um, and be around some below uh, sea level, we have historical accounts of where landowners or tenants refused to walk their land. They didn't want to bear the cost of taking land out of production, of um, building the banks, and also having to, sometimes they had to lease access to those big water warping drain. So there was a big financial cost to it. So we can see in the LIDAR where land landowners have decided not to walk their ground. Um, we can also see some of those higher points that, of the windblown sands protruding here. Um, so what are those implications of the warp deposits? As I've said before, they can be over one metre thick and it can effectively seal and bury old land surfaces. And these might protect environmental and cultural material and waterlogged deposits. And it may also have sealed uh, archaeological features and finds on those islands of windblown sands where they, know, where they have been covered. And these are an important interface between the riverine wetlands and the high ground to the east. So I'm going to have a quick look at this area up here. Um, in the LIDAR, you can see how the windblown sand is just poking out over the warped ground around it, which looks a lot more level. Um, you can see how the crop has uh, reacted to that windblown sand as well. And here we have a Second World War heavy anti-aircraft battery, which has just taken advantage of that slight elevated position. And we can also see those sands quite clearly in the uh, in recent older photography as well. So together we have an ability to map those uh, exposed windblown sands, which will also tell us where those are in areas that are buried next to them as well. So I'm going to quickly move on to the completely contrasting uh, landscape of the land of the Ironstone Plateau, just a mere two or three kilometres to the uh, to the to the east. So, steel production began in Scunthorpe in the la uh, latter part of the 19th century, and it still continues today. The development of the industry will, of course, be well documented through various company plans and records and so forth. But there's also a ri really rich uh, variety of historical and recent aerial f uh, imagery. And I'm trying to put this together to pull something which is a resource for a, a non-specialist audience, and in particular school children in the area, to help them understand their relatively recent industrial heritage. If we look at a historic map, this is from 1886. Um, ironstone was already being mined in this area. This is the, uh, the workings of the rail links and so forth here. And we have a couple of test trial holes here to see the depth of the deposits. But at this point, the particular works that I'm going to look at, the Lysette steel works, haven't yet been built. I've chosen this one because it has much better photographic coverage than the other steel works to the south, which we're operating at this time. So the lights at Steelworks were uh, established in the early 20th century and they had quickly expanded into the complex that we see here um, by the middle of that century. So we can see quite a, quite a footprint. However, 
it has now been com almost completely dismantled and as I said before it's used for lighter industry and, um, and distribution warehouses and the like and there's very little as far as I can see of the, the built heritage uh, surviving in this area but there may be some substantial earthworks associated with the quarrying and the, uh, and the later deposition of slag and the like but uh, for the most part there's very little surviving. So these historic photographs provide an opportunity to demonstrate and discuss this industrial heritage. The vertical photographs are excellent. They produce like a, the, uh, provide a, a plan-like view in which to discuss the various processes because this site basically did everything. It was a, it was a beginning to end process that all took place within this one uh, complex. So let's look first at, go back. Um, I'm going to concentrate first on this area here, which is where they're actually taking the iron ore out of the ground. In this area, the ore, as I explained on the ironstone platter, is exposed at the surface. It's exposed at the surface, so it was relatively easy to access. Um, faces were cut into the ironstone, the overburden was put to one side, and the ore was trolleyed off to the, to the works itself. This area here is... Um, in, in, in English terms, quite a famous um, Iron Age uh, and Romano-British settlement, which, as you can see, was precariously uh, um, nearly uh, destroyed by the ironstone quarrying. Um, back to our plan again, and I'll move on to number two, which is this area here. Um, I forgot to mention, this is these um, oblique photographs, which give us that nice sideways view so we can really see what's going on and what these complexes look like, um, are part of the Aerofilms collection, which has recently been digitised by Historic England. So these are on open access to anyone. And what I'm trying to do is, is to use some of those to explain the process in the hope that people will then go and look at more of them, because there are literally hundreds of this particular site. So this is the sinter plant. This is where the iron ore would be taken in. They also had to, as well as their local ores from these quarries, they had to bring them in ores from further south because they had a difficult chemical um, composition and they were better at producing steel. So they had to blend the ores, mix them together, and then uh, generate in a, in a composition that was suitable to put into the blast furnaces. Um, moving on to the, to the hot area, so to speak, here, the main part of the complex. We have excellent photographs that show us that all of the processes that are going on. Um, so we have the blast furnaces here. You can maybe see these um, scaffolding-like ramps. This is where the ore would be taken up and then tipped in, charging the furnace from the top. We have cowper stoves behind, which are the heat-generating uh, stoves. We have a gas holder. We have coke ovens, banks of coke ovens here, and um, wooden cooling towers. I had no idea about wooden cooling towers. Amazing structures built of cedar. Um, seem to come in kit form from a place in Brat which is not too far, a city not too far to the uh, to the northwest. Um, these were obviously later replaced by concrete ones, and there are photographs of the of them overlapping, which is quite impressive. And the melting shop, where the the steel that was produced in those furnaces would then be taken in, reheated, and then either rolled out or, or processed in a further way, so that it became the product. Um, you can just also see in this photograph the other steelworks in the background. These are the ones that had earlier origins. And you can see there's kind of little clusters because at this time there were a lot of different um, enterprises and industries and they kind of coalesced later into what we know now as uh, Scunthorpe Steels, um, Tata, but maybe, maybe someone else by tomorrow, I don't know. Um, obviously, we don't have any in-process photographs for the licensed steel works, but this is one that was taken a couple of years ago by Dave McLeod of um, the, uh, the steel works to the, to the south. Um, we can see here, there's, I think they're uh, tapping the slag here out into this, uh, into this area. All the furnaces were named after British Queens, so we can see this is coming from Queen Anne. And I'm going to end quickly on the, um, on the, on the slag heap which is this area here. Um, this is quite interesting. The slag heap very quickly um, covered up the, uh, this moated site, this medieval moated site. It was under here somewhere. And then when they, re um, 
re, uh, re landscape the whole works, they decide to, to take that uh, overburden off and to re excavate the moat. So now, magically, we can see it as an earthwork in the Lindar. Um, it also was encroaching on the site of All Saints and uh, Church and Graveyard, and also the site of an Anglo Saxon settlement, which, uh, when it was excavated, revealed over 40 buildings. Um, and ironically, it wasn't actually the encroachment of the slag that prompted this excavation, it was uh, sand extraction. So, because we're on the very edge here, and we're in the windblown sands. And then I'll just end by taking you to this little point here on the edge of the, uh, the slag heap at Scunthorpe. Um, this again is one of these aero, aero film photographs, and most of them are kind of like, look at the company, look at the, the, uh, the, the layout and everything. And I love this one because it's just a little, a little point in time where the little steam engine has pulled along the tipper wagons from the, uh, from the steelworks with the slag in it. I think those have still got their slag in. This one's just tipped out. It's almost like popping an ice cube out of a tray. We can see the shape of the tipped waste here and some of the others. Um, I'm, I'm assuming they had to work at night because on the top of the slag heap, this is all slag, all of this, on the top of the slag heap we've got a little row of uh, with lamps and also a telegraph wire, so I imagine they were working through the, uh, the cold winter nights in Scunthorpe. And uh, just looking in, in detail at the little uh, steam engine, we can see the tip of wagons, the one with the, the slag in still, the one that's just tipped, and there's a chap there and he's looking up and he's looking up at the camera because I'd imagine at that time in the 1950s, it wasn't that often that an aeroplane would come over you and take a photograph at a relatively low altitude. But I bet he didn't think that we'd be standing here today looking back down at him. Thank you.